Sister Geronimo was as good as her word, as one might reasonably expect from a nun, and popped Lord Teddy's shoulder back into its socket on her first attempt. Truth be told, she was hoping the Duke might be overcome by pain and pass out, which she intended to interpret as an annulment of their partnership. But Teddy gritted his square white teeth and bore the excruciating agony with no more than an exclamation of, Blimey! after the sharp blow from the flat of the nun's hand. Once his upper arm was reunited with his shoulder blade, Teddy swallowed some Tylenol from the dispensary and had Geronima bind his shoulder tightly. The bandaging operation took less than five minutes, and then they were out of the black site and headed for the Skyblade craft. Geronima estimated that they had perhaps another five minutes before the authorities traced the harbor disaster back to the site and moved in to find a dozen unconscious agents in the corridor. Protocol would usually require Sister Geronima to erase all hard drives before an evacuation, but Miles Fowl had already accomplished that for her. Miles Fowl had erased all acronym files everywhere, except on his own computer. I must catch that Nino, she realized. He knows all our secrets. Acronym was sanctioned by the governments of 37 countries to operate inside their borders, but they were also mandated in 28 of those countries to submit detailed reports for every operation on the books. At last count, Sister Geronima herself was running seven unreported operations, and across all divisions of Acronym there were probably a hundred more. And now Miles Fowl had the details of almost every one, and he could sell those details to any network on the planet. And that, thought Geronima, could be muy inconveniente, because even though Acronym was an intergovernmental clandestine agency, they had over the years broken more laws than the rest of the world's secret services put together. In fact, if Miles Fowl were to leak the stolen files, it could spell the end of Acronym, and federal prison time for many of its upper Eclion, including Sister Geronima herself. Lord Teddy and the nun made it to the Skyblade, but were unable to take off as the Dutch police arrived faster than anticipated. And so nun and noblemen were forced to sit inside the airplane in silence while the Amsterdam armed response units swarmed all over the black site. The time was not completely wasted, though, as Lord Teddy docked his phone with the Skyblade's media system and brought up a map on the smart windshield. A red dot, which represented the troll's cellophane wrapped signature, pulsed in the suburbs. You see, madame, he said, drumming the glass with the same finger that had held a knife to Geronimo's throat in the very recent past. Less than five minutes flight time. Our errant band must shall be trussed like turkeys before lunch. Geronima merely nodded. She knew who Lord Teddy Bleedum Dry was. Most people with a smartphone would recognize the Duke of Scilly. In fact, Acronym had investigated him briefly a few years back, when a junior agent had suggested that Bleedum Dry might be using some kind of sorcery to save Forever Young. Seeing the man now, up close, Sister Geronima saw that he was not, in fact, young, but neither was he old. His skin was weathered with an odd blotchy sheen to it, which reminded Geronima of the cured sobrasada sausages that her grandfather used to hang in her cellar. However, there was no denying that his beard was magnificent and virtually impossible to resist, and Geronima found her hand reaching out for a stroke. The Duke caught the movement and said, I know, magnificent. Look, but please don't touch. Geronima withdrew her fingers, thinking that it was an odd that such a high-profile nobleman could conduct a secret life as some kind of vigilante child catcher. Perhaps I should recruit him, she thought. But then she remembered the feel of her own knife on her neck and decided to focus on surviving the mission. As soon as the swarm of armed police had disappeared inside the building, Teddy nosed the plane out from behind a barge and into the canal. There was some police activity in the canal network, but no one had yet thought to close the locks or even set up barriers. So Teddy was able to navigate easily to the harbor. He took off using the angled plane on the I Museum's roof as a runway, which made him chuckle as the swimmers dove to get out of the Skyblade's trajectory. We are coming, Miles Fowl, he said. He will not escape again. This sounded rather personal to Sister Geronima, and in her experience, men with personal agendas made mistakes. I will disable this man as a first opportunity, she thought, and then calling reinforcements somehow. She felt reasonably confident that Lord Teddy was thinking along the same lines, but she was wrong. Because an Englishman's word was his bond, Teddy would consider it very bad form to turn on Sister Geronimo without provocation. But he was quietly confident that provocation would be coming his way. Geronimo was impressed by the plane and took a mental note of the make and model, 
which was embossed on the steering wheel, along with what she could swear was a line drawing of Lord Teddy himself. Maishi Skyblade, she thought. Hakunum doesn't have anything so elegante. It is always overkill with our people. Helicopters and 50 caliber guns. Perhaps I can learn something from this Lord Teddy. The first thing she learned was that the Fowl Twins had somehow managed to divest the troll of its radiation-infused coating. Lord Teddy's tracker found it on the outskirts of Amsterdam, discarded in a quaint windmill that was adjacent to a canal, which made landing quite convenient. Blast it! He swore. They have slipped right through the net! This was upsetting, yes, but Lord Teddy thrilled to the hunt and was already figuring out how he could track this particular quarry. He knelt by car tracks leading away from the windmill. They are mobile, he said, which means they have access to funding. Sister Geronimo also had some experience with hunting. After all, that was a large part of her occupation. First she hunted, then she interrogated, and then came stage three, the terminal stage. They will want to blend in, she said, except the boy Miles. He is too much of a uh, peacock. That is true, madame, said Teddy. The boy has a uh, distinctive look, and that will be his downfall. They returned to the Skyblade, and Lord Teddy pressed the embossed Maishi logo on the steering wheel, which put him straight through to the Maishi 24-hour concierge line. A cheerful voice said, Hi, Lord Bleed em Dry. This is Douglas on the Maishi line. Your crime is worth our time. How may I be of assistance? Good morning to you, my boy, said the Duke. I am going to give you a list of items, and I want you to check to see if any of them have been ordered online from my approximate location in the past 15 minutes. Is that at all possible, do you think? It is absolutely possible, your grace, said Doug Douglas enthusiastically. And may I say, I am a huge fan and delighted to be of any assistance. Good fellow, Douglas, said Lord Teddy. Shall I continue on and present my list? Fire it away, said Douglas. And just to inform you, because this is an online service without any actual physical action required, murder or theft and so forth, your no-claims bonus as a concierge-level customer remains intact and your premium will be unaffected. Capito, my boy, said Lord Teddy, and he read out his list. It was short, but most specific. We have a hit, said Douglas some 20 seconds later. One of the items on your list was ordered by Master Porter in the past hour, a designer store from the most juvenile gentleman. Delivery will be bundled and expedited to a very specific longitude and latitude. Lord Teddy punched the delivery site into his computer, and, in moments, the Skyblade had plotted a flight course. Will there be anything else, Your Grace? asked Douglas. I think that will be all for the moment, Douglas, said Lord Teddy. And may I say, you have been most helpful. A number of skull outlines appeared on the windshield. Thank you, Your Grace. Would you like to leave some Maishi Corporation feedback skulls? It would be my pleasure, Douglas, my boy, said the Duke. He tapped five of the six skulls, turned them gold, and left a comment. I found Douglas to be the epitome of efficiency. He has an excellent manner, and I would have no hesitation in recommending him to all your mastermind needs. Seconds later, Douglas had sent a thumbs up emoticon and two smiley faces with hearts for eyes. One has fans, Lord Teddy explained to the nun in the co-pilot seat. It's embarrassing, but one cannot blame commoners for being starstruck, I suppose. The Duke is like Miles Fowl, vain, thought Geronimo. A shink in his armor. She looked forward to sticking her knife into that chink and twisting the blade. Some hours later, we find our heroes overnighting on the Verona-bound Orient Express. The tranquility on board the luxury train was somewhat at odds with the thundercloud spewing rain from above the hulking ridges of the Swiss Alps. Like the locomotive itself, the Regrettables were in the eye of their own personal storm, and Miles in particular was acutely aware that this rest period must be fully utilized to explore their options and assess their strengths, and for that matter, their shortcomings. To this end, he was examining Specialist Heights' equipment, which was more technologically advanced than anything he had ever seen. Which is not to say he did not understand its workings. Rather, its workings had solved some problems he had been wrestling with. The theory of utilizing carbon-based polymers to form simple circuitry was still in its infancy in human laboratories, except for in Artemis' lab, where he had managed to employ organometallics to grow a large part of his self-winding rocket engine. 
But the fairy people had taken the technique far beyond anything humans could currently achieve, and were using it to power and regulate almost every part of the LEP suit. The growth of the circuits themselves could be achieved through solar energy, when available, and in effect, the circuits and cells become their own batteries. As far as Miles could determine, the operating system was already partially restored after the EMP on Dalky Island, and he was able to use Nani's translating software, which of course included Gnomish, to deduce that functions would begin to return in less than a day. Nani used her final spurt of power probing Lazuli's systems, then took a nap. We are all running on empty, thought Miles. Beckett and Whistleblower were asleep in the cabin's top bunk, having nodded off watching ASMR videos on a customer tablet connected to the train's Wi-Fi. It's amazing how many videos of gummy candy those two can watch, thought Miles. As for Specialist Heights, she was seated bolt upright across the small varnished table, finishing her salad with great deliberation and no obvious relish, as though the food were simply fuel and not something to be enjoyed or dallied over. Without her helmet, the fairy seemed very childlike, and it was all Miles could do not to patronize her, as this was his natural instinct with almost everyone he came into contact with. People thought Artemis was condescending, but Angeline Fowler had once told Miles that he himself was at least five times more patronizing than his older brother, which Miles accepted as fact, feeling neither insulted nor complimented. The journey to the Orient Express was uneventful, and so a brisk summary will best serve to illuminate the five-hour ride. Once Whistleblower had been coaxed into the self-driving car, Miles set about ordering the supplies they would need moving forward. These were to be delivered to Verona, where the Orient Express would make a stop at 1700 hours the following evening. The legendary express was generally booked for up for months in advance, but since the late 19th century, when the Fowl family in its entirety had been briefly outlawed by the governments of Germany, Switzerland, and Austria, the family matriarch Peg O'Connor Fowl, often and quite really referred to as Pirate Peg, had paid the Compagnie Internationale des Wagons Lits an extraordinary amount of gold to engineer a secret cabin in the rear car that would be made available exclusively and in proprietary to the Fowl family. In this way, Peg could cross Europe in comfort and continue to service her considerable interest in Constantinople. And it had been a simple matter for Miles to dump the self-driving car in Gare de Ilst in Paris and take advantage of Cabin F. Artemis had often taken advantage of Cabin F, and Miles had learned the code for the electronic lock when he was four years old. The rest of the passengers and crew believed Cabin F to be part of the engine car, because the door was disguised as a blank panel, but there was a single pursuer and who kept the cabin supplied with food and a tablet device that had lulled Beckett and Whistleblower to sleep. Unfortunately, clothing-wise, the carriage contained little to help the group blend in, unless they wanted to stand on each other's shoulders and dress in a Victorian ball gown. This time, the small refrigerator was stocked with fresh salad, fruit, and a roasted chicken that Beckett and Whistleblower devoured down to the bones, which the toy troll then crunched to dust. But there was nothing in the way of charging equipment, aside from one European socket that Nani could leech from, but would not provide her with anything close to the amount of energy she required for full functionality. It's time for Father to update this shrine car, Miles thought. At the very least, we need the latest in communications and technology. They would have both when they were in Verona. Once they reached the northern Italian city, Miles realized, he would have to agree to a fairy extraction. He had been hoping to wrap this up, the Fowl Twins' first grand adventure, without involving the LEP, but with that level of pride came an inevitable painful fall. If there had been just one criminal mastermind and one single shadowy organization to vanquish, Miles felt he would have been more than equal to the task, but both together with was a considerable challenge, and he would never forgive himself if something were to happen to Beckett. Across the small, lacquered table, Specialist Heights finished her last stock of celery and declared, I have a plan, human. We will remain on this train until Istanbul, and by then my circuits will have regenerated and I can call in the LEP. I disagree, Specialist, said Miles. If you don't mind me saying, you seem very young to be devising strategy. Those really could not help thinking that this was a bit rich. I am young? Me? You are a mere child. I am 60 years old. You do not have the appearance of a sexagerian, noted Miles. Species develop at different rates, explained the pixel. Most fairies are walking after a week. We can read and write after a year. I finished my law diploma when I was 10. I have three friends and they are all in state of relationships. And what is your lifespan? Lazuli shrugged. Who knows? I'm a hybrid. It could be anything from 300 years to millennium. 
I'd envy you that time, said Miles. There is so much you could learn. One of the things I did learn, said Lazuli, is how to strategize. It was a valid point, but Miles still felt compelled to disagree. We must disembark at Verona, he insisted. It is dangerous to stay enclosed in this car for too long without secured communications, as we must assume that either the Duke or Sister Geronima will somehow track us down, and we are basically trapped in the steel box. I've chosen a rendezvous point for us to collect our supplies. Once there, I can rig your communicator to a human power source, providing you allow me to examine it, and you may summon reinforcements to evacuate us to safety immediately. Of course, you may stay on the train, but I fancy Whistleblower will wish to remain with Beckett. Lazuli considered this and had to admit to herself that the human's plan was sound. It would mean allowing Miles to check out even more of her equipment, but the fowls were historically friends to the fairy folk. And, after all, humans could be mind wiped. Ten minutes after Recon arrived, the twins would wake up in their own beds with no idea that any of this had ever happened. I agree, human boy, said Lazuli, undoing the strap on her control gauntlet. Miles thought it slightly odd that Specialist Heights would turn over her computer without objection. My only stipulation, he said, is that there be no interference with me or my brother. We go our own way and that's the end of it. For now, said Lazuli, in a way Miles found slightly unsettling. It occurred to him that perhaps the fairy people might not want more fowls in their world, and they might decide to do something about it. And so, when Specialist Heights climbed to the foot of the top bunk and curled herself in a ball at the end, Miles ignored his own exhaustion, and, once he had finished examining Specialist Heights' gauntlet, he used Nani's slightly restored energy levels to study the fairy-related videos left behind by Artemis. Because, as his big brother often said, Know nigh enemy, and assume everyone is your enemy, for it is ever true that the world resents genius. Words Miles intended to live by, even though they were grandiose and long-winded, like Artemis himself. To keep himself amused, Miles edited Artemis' every speech down to less than a quarter of its original length, and saved the edits on a separate file in case he needed references that were a little more concise. While doing so, Miles played Schubert's Symphony No. 9 in his mind. He chose this particular piece because it was in C major and matched Beckett's whistle-slash-snores. After an hour or so, Miles found the file that might come in especially useful if the fairy folk were not at all as friendly as Lazuli, who, in all honesty, was not all that friendly.